Good morning, Chameleon Academy. I'm just here doing a little bit of maintenance for the plants inside of the the uh, Arboreal XL. I thought I'd give you a view from inside the enclosure. So. And this enclosure is the one that we're going to have the uh, the chameleon, the carpet chameleon, the fantasticus gecko, the azurius frog. So this will be the community enclosure. And since I've been talking about that, there have been a number of questions and concerns raised about uh, me doing this. And so let's go ahead and talk about those head on. Uh, the first one is a, a concern about if I show it, yes, it may work great for me, but that's because I know these animals and I'm highly experienced. And so it may work great for me, but does that mean it's going to work great for everybody else? And if I show it, is that going to encourage people to do it, even if they aren't ready to do it? And that is a valid concern. Anytime you show something, it encourages people to do it. And this is something I've been struggling with for the last couple of months because my job here as a Chameleon Academy is to share information, is to share uh, knowledge and how to do things and help people. But at what point is helping someone do something, encouraging them to do something they wouldn't have done otherwise? Uh, I recently went through this when I did some uh, videos on hatching a panther egg and taking care of a hatchling. Well, I love hatching chameleons, and I think it can be a great time for people if they are properly prepared for it. But unfortunately, what was going on in the world is that the people selling the eggs weren't being as uh, forthright. They were selling them as being a cheaper way to get into, cha into chameleons. It, it is an easier way to get into chameleons. Both of those are deceptive marketing. They are, that's not, correct. Uh, it is not cheaper. If you do it right, it's not cheaper. And it's not easier. There's so much more that you need to know when you are raising up a hatchling. And so the, uh, the struggle was, do I make videos on how to do it, knowing that if I provide the information on how to do it, it's like I'm encouraging it. I'm, I'm making it seem easy. And I mean, th that's my job. When I am doing educational stuff, I want to make it seem easy. And <laughs> if I do my job right, it seems easy and you can do it. Um, and so the what I was struggling with was, if I provide this information, will more people go out and buy eggs? And in the end, I decided that my place here is to provide the education I will provide the insight as well. While I'm providing the education, I'm also going to provide warnings. Warnings that this isn't easier than buying a well-started juvenile from a respected and uh, reputable breeder. But I still want to provide the information. I think that's valuable. And this is very much in the same vein as that. I've decided that I am going to show all of the steps necessary to evaluate what what reptiles to keep together, how to plan to keep them together. And it's going to be a, a many, many vlogs of me going through this. And every vlog I'm going to have to say, uh, be very careful in doing this because it's not easy. And I know I'm going to be running into this situation where people think that I'm saying it's okay to throw reptiles together. And you know, already I'm hearing from people who are so excitedly telling me about how they're combining reptiles and those reptiles are not compatible. And so I acknowledge that I'm probably going to have to hurt people's feelings as they come forward and they're proud to tell me how they're keeping certain species together, which are from different environments or are not compatible because one will eat the other. And so I do know that this is already happening. And I want to make sure, as sure as I can, that I can get the information out there without encouraging uh, reckless cohabitation. 
And for everyone out there, veiled chameleons will eat anything as big as a sparrow. If you are keeping anything with a veiled chameleon that's smaller than a sparrow, you are raising up its future food. Panther chameleons are not far behind. So to everyone who's concerned about whether me doing this is going to encourage people to do it themselves, I will say that your concern is valid and it's something that I'm taking into account. You are absolutely correct. It is something to be concerned about and I'm going to have to walk that tightrope of trying to provide education without encouraging people to do it uh, that shouldn't be doing it. And I already know, no matter how hard I say it is, no matter how much I say prepare through all of this, people are going to cohab reptiles anyway. And they'll be excited to see me doing it because then that justifies them doing it even though they haven't gone through any of the steps. So I don't know that I am making the right decision. This will be one of those things that I look back in hindsight and I say, did I make the right decision to provide that information, to do it the way I did it? Maybe I should have done it differently. I don't know. Uh, we will know, <laughs> I'll look back in about a year or so, and uh, maybe, maybe I'll have a little bit more insight as to how this went and if I did it right and if I would do it uh, differently in the future. So to all of you who have expressed your concern, yep, I hear you, you're right, and we'll see if uh, this blows up in my face or not. All right, everybody, I gotta address something that needs to be said. I am doing a community enclosure, which means I am cohabbing three different reptile amphibians. I know there are a number of you out there who are already cohabbing different reptiles. And I know that you haven't put in the effort to figure out what reptiles go together. It's like you pick your favorite ones and you throw them together and say, look, they're happy. And that's not what I am doing here. If you haven't poured over the husbandry of each, of the reptiles that you're dealing with and you haven't gotten a piece of paper and figured out all the different uh, climates, microclimates, environments that you're going to recreate in your large enclosure, not the minimum enclosure, the large enclosure, then you're probably doing it wrong. I'm going to come right out and say this is not going to be a feel-good project for you and I, if, you, if you come in the comments and you talk about how you're putting together certain reptiles that don't belong together and it's obvious you if you're going to comment that you are cohabbing reptiles please in your comment explain all the process that you went through to decide that those were compatible and how you made your enclosure compatible for the reptiles that you have if you comment on my video saying, hey, I just put together a cat and a rat and they're really, really happy. I am duty bound to say something not nice as a comment. I'll, I'll word it as politely as possible. But the fact is, I am going out on a limb to doing to do this project and do it publicly. And the concern that I just addressed and many people have is that if I do this, that people are going to say, oh, okay, it's okay. And totally bypass all of the planning that I'm showing that I'm doing and just throw together two reptiles that they got from Petco. If you're going to comment, remember, I have to acknowledge your comment. Please help me by showing me that you really thought out putting together a garter snake and a veiled chameleon. I, I mean, if you do that, I, I have to say something. I have to say, no, that's not the right way to do it. So please be good to yourself and your reptiles. Do your planning. Be kind to me if you comment and communicate the planning that you did. And then we can maybe talk about your planning. We can talk about, oh, how you can make it better or wow, that's great. And you can be an example to the rest of the community as to how to do it. But just realize I am in a precarious position doing this project and I 
have to respond in a responsible way to any comments. So be good to me, please. Now the next most common question or comments I've received are on questioning my choice of Denver Bates Azurius, Tinctorius Azurius, as the frog in the enclosure. Uh, obviously the carpet chameleon and the year plate is fantastic as gecko. They're from Madagascar and Madagascar has its own dart frog equivalent called Mantellas. And, uh, and so there's been a lot of questioning as to why I would uh, select a new world dart frog instead of a Mantella. And it, it the, <laughs> the comments range from, Oh, wouldn't it be cool if you got them all from Madagascar to you should use something from Madagascar. It's better. And guys, uh, all right. So there is such thing called a, a biotope environment where the hobbyist uh, creates a, uh, an enclosure that has animals and plant life that comes from a certain biotope. And this is like a uh, high end sports for uh, the herpeticulturist because uh, that's challenging. If you are going to look at what plant life comes from the area, uh, you're, you're really hardcore and that's, that's very cool. That is a great challenge. Uh, but in my particular case, uh, I, I use, I'm using plants that are from all over the world. Southeast Asia, the New World, uh, the Tradescantia comes from the New World, but the variety was invented or developed in the Netherlands. And so there's absolutely nothing consistent about that biotope that I'm creating. It's just a coincidence that two of the inhabitants are from Madagascar. And I've been to Madagascar and I've seen the carpet chameleon in its environment. I've seen the Fantasticus in its environment and I've seen Mantellus. And I can tell you, the chances that any of them would see each other are pretty slim. Their environments are quite different. So there isn't a compelling reason that I can see as to why being on the same land mass means that there's some sort of important connection between them. Now, I acknowledge having uh, all the Madagascar animals would be kind of cool, but the fact is that I love Azurius way too much, and this is for my enjoyment. And having animals from around the world in the same uh, in enclosure is not going to harm them one bit. So, yes, I acknowledge that the dart frog is from the New World, and the other two are from Madagascar. And I acknowledge it would be fun to say, well, I've got Madagascar animals in there. But let's not get too hung up on the origin of the original species. Only one of them is really from Madagascar. The other two are from California. They are naturalized US citizens. And I will say that the whole idea of uh, having a consistent biotope is, is idealistic and it's a lot of fun. But I'll tell you, when I was in Madagascar, I saw plenty of chameleons on introduced plants. There is so much deforestation. There is so much of invasive introduced plant life that even the carpet chameleons that I was seeing we're not in their biotope. So biotope uh, enclosure is a very cool idea. I'm not gonna be doing that in this case. And there's no reason why that's any better than what I'm doing. Unless you guys can come up with a reason. If you can, go ahead, let me know. Otherwise, you're gonna be seeing a uh, blue dart frog with a carpet chameleon and a satanic leaf del gecko. And we're all gonna be happy for it. Well, at least I'm gonna be happy for it. And it's in my studio, so that's what counts. But seriously, keep the comments coming. Uh, I'm not saying this to criticize or saying you're wrong. Uh, give me your comments. I want to hear them. And that is what keeps me fresh, is hearing the arguments and the thoughts of others. And then I give mine. Okay, let's go on to the next question. So there was an interesting comment by Stwinky. <laughs> I love these screen names. Uh, talking about how this cohabbing of the reptiles isn't for him or her, and uh, but was uh, speculating that we may see more of it in the future. And this is actually correct. The one very limiting factor as to why we've 
not been able to make cohabbing uh, enclosures be, uh, successful before is because we have, at least in the United States, this obsession with the minimum cage size. And you look on the care sheets, the minimum cage size, and we don't go uh, beyond that. Well, that minimum cage size is for one individual of that one species. When we start having, we're having a convergence of two different movements in herpeticulture. One is to uh, be more aware of the environment. The, this whole bioactive thing is not about having fancy soil. It's uh, underlying that is an awareness of the entire environment within the enclosure. And so you're changing your mindset from wrapping a cage around a chameleon to creating an entire environment that nurtures your chameleon. It's a totally different mindset, but you can see how if you embrace that mindset and you step up to that level of thinking that you can start thinking about the environments for different reptiles. That change in mindset converging with this very positive trend of getting large enclosures, uh, extra large enclosures, going beyond the way beyond the minimum is allowing us options. And we are able to expand our herpeticultural uh, projects to include things that are bigger and more ambitious than they were before. So I don't see that it'll ever be a beginner thing to create an enclosure and put three different reptiles in it. But I do see that we are developing skills as a community. You know, there, there's some, I'm not talking about individuals. There's some exceptional individuals who could have done this all along, but I'm talking about generally speaking as a community, we are developing skills in mindsets that open up more opportunities for us and having large community uh, uh, enclosures is one of those things. Now, me personally, I, I don't, I haven't gotten to the point where I think that this is uh, a, a, a something that I want to do, that I have to do, that is just so exciting for me to do. I'm doing this once because I want to demonstrate a fun thing for the vlog. Uh, I want to do a fun project, but I don't think I'm going to be doing more of this. Uh, I very much enjoy having one reptile in a large enclosure with my new bioactive type approach. And by when, when I say my, I don't mean that I created it. I mean, it's, it's more new for me. And so I probably am not going to be doing a whole lot more in this direction because you can... Uh, do so much more with the individual animal and focus on the individual animal when you only have one to think about. And that's really where my mindset is now. Uh, will I in the future get to the point where I enjoy having these large community enclosures? Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, but, uh, but honestly, I don't see the appeal of it. It doesn't appeal to me more than having an individual reptile in an individual cage does. Um, I actually prefer the individual reptile in the individual cage. But that may be just uh, because of where I came from and how I grew up in herpeticulture. What I'm saying is, if you are part of this, what I'm calling the enrichment generation, where you're approaching herpeticulture, you're just starting out in herpeticulture with the environment mind, the holistic mindset, and you're not even bothering to look at what the minimum cage dimensions are, except to just uh, sneer at it and uh, go to something at least twice as big. If you're part of that generation, maybe this is a direction you want to go. Maybe this is what's going to fulfill you. Well then, I encourage you, and if this is, say, a first baby step to uh, help you get to there, then I'm glad to be part of it. All right, folks, I want to say thank you very much for joining me at 5 a.m. again <laughs> this morning. Yeah, these are my planter box enclosures. It's wonderful starting the day with the chameleon community. 
Later on today, we have the Chameleons and Coffee live session. That's at 12 noon Pacific. It's here on YouTube. And I have a guest, Troy Goldberg, who is highly experienced with dart frogs. And so bring all of your dart frog questions. I just released an interview with him that was pretty much all about how to get my uh, Azurius, my blue dart frog, to be happy in the enclosure that I'm building. So this is, this is what I'm talking about, about doing your research. Even I'm doing my research. But join us. Bring your questions about dart frogs. And in the words of some of the greatest philosophers of my lifetime, be excellent to each other. <laughs>